you started. We just put to black. Oh, sounds good. And QE2 is about 1.7 miles in size, and we know it's a safe distance away. It's about 3.6 million miles from the planet. And we have an image that you're looking at right now. It was taken yesterday from the South African Astronomical Observatory. So indeed, telescopes around the world are beginning to see it. We are right now in Mission Control to bring you a preview show of QE2 and give you some tips on how to see it for yourself and also answer some of your questions posted on social media. And this is all before Closest Approach, which occurs tomorrow, May 31st, at 1.59 p.m. Pacific, 4.59 Eastern Time, and 20.59 UTC. Hello everyone, I'm Gay Hill. We'll be talking to folks at the South African Observatory in just a moment, but let's give you a little background on the asteroid. Protecting the planet is a NASA priority, and though this asteroid is not a threat, it is an excellent learning opportunity. NASA will be getting its best look at this asteroid ever using advanced and detailed radar. Let me introduce you right now to Paul Chodas. He's a scientist with NASA's Near Earth Object Program Office based right here at JPL. The NEO program has already identified 95% of the asteroids that have orbits very close to Earth and are over one kilometer uh, in diameter, which is about a half a mile in diameter. 1998 QED happens to be one of these that we're talking about. And Paul, why don't you just kind of brief us, tell us a little bit about this particular asteroid. Well, this is one of the big ones. So it's one of the 95% that we've characterized. It was discovered about 15 years ago, and it's one of the initial successes of uh, our uh, efforts to find the big asteroids that could hit the Earth and cause global catastrophe. So it's, uh, it's certainly one to keep an eye on. And we know it's passing at a comfortable distance. And the name, why, why 1998 QE2? There's a formula to this, right? Yes, it's not named after the ocean liner. It's not named <laughs> after Queen Elizabeth II. It's, it's a standard asteroid name. 1998 is the year it was discovered, and Q indicates the month. And E2, um, it was, uh, the previous one was uh, D2, and the next one will be F2. It's just a standard designation. All right, so you gave us an image yesterday to show us the orbit of QE2, yes. and we can go to it right now and take yes. a look at it. It's pretty large. Yes, this is an eccentric orbit. You can see that it, uh, right now it's right beside the Earth, very close, but at its farthest point from the Sun, it goes out to the outer asteroid belt, in fact, pretty close to the orbit of Jupiter. So it's an eccentric orbit. In a way, it's a visitor from deep space. And you also gave us a, a, a graphic to show us the closest approach, to kind of give us an understanding of how far away it really is. Just to put it in perspective, that's right. And we have that image oh, right here. Oh, here it is. Uh, yes, you can see on the left is the Earth, and the ring around the Earth is the Moon's orbit for scale. You can see that the asteroid passes by. Uh, I put the dates on this diagram. It's about 15 times farther than the Moon is from the Earth. So it's a very comfortable distance. But for an asteroid this size, that's uh, that's a close shave. So this is one you would keep an eye on if it, for any reason, gets closer to us than the distance we have right here. Exactly. We want to keep an eye on all of the, these asteroids, especially the large ones. And uh, we don't know of any uh, asteroids that have a significant chance of hitting the Earth right now, but we calculate the orbits for all of them and project them into the future. So we're familiar with this particular asteroid. Do we know what it's made of? What are some of the characteristics? Things like that. Yes, this, uh, this asteroid is what we call a C-type, and we think that is uh, associated with carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. So we have uh, an example of a carbonaceous chondrite meteorite. It's very dark. This, the outer crust, of course, is black, as many meteorites are, but even the inside is very dark indeed. It's a very primitive type of uh, meteorite formed in the outer solar system. It has uh, amino acids in it, organic compounds, and a lot of uh, carbon, which makes it dark. So it is a very dark object. All right, so we have been briefed a little bit on QE2, and let's go ahead and speak to some folks who have actually seen it. Uh, QE2 was discovered 15 years ago in a survey using optical telescopes, and the South African Astronomical Observatory in Sutherland is a 
uh, optical tel telescope. It's used for education and also research. And on the line right now is Nick Loring. She is one of the astronomers at that facility. Nick, what do you see? What did you see last night? Hi there, Gay. Um, well, last night we, we saw the asteroid. So what we could see was we could see a few background stars, which were just looked like white specks of light, which weren't moving. And then we actually saw this white star that looked like a star moving across the field, just very, very slowly. And um, we, we knew immediately that was the asteroid because it was moving against the, the background of the stationary stars. So, so it just looked like a white dot. It actually looked like a star. It's just that we could tell it wasn't a star because it was moving relative to the background stars. Was this difficult to find? It was actually very easy to find because um, the asteroid's orbit has been is, has been mapped very well, and it's um, we actually used JPL's um, web page to um, find the coordinates at a specific time, pointed the te telescope at the at the coordinates, and, and there it was, right right in the middle. Well, that's uh, Paul. They, uh, Nick mentioned that she used uh, JPL's website to help her with the coordinates. Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, um, asteroids are. Um, observed by astronomers around the world and all of the data is collected into a large set of um, observations which we then use to calculate an orbit and run it into the future. And so we can com predict where she should look to find this asteroid and uh, we know pretty well, pretty accurately where it is. So the, uh, if the predictions you get from our website on the orbital elements and where to look are quite accurate. We're glad to hear that was helpful, Nick. And now, how are people reacting to this? Are they very enthused and excited? Absolutely, yeah. People are really excited because I think it's just nice when you can actually see something um, for your, with your own eyes. You know, when, when, when we talk about asteroids, we think of things far away in space that we can't see. And now all of a sudden, they can actually watch the asteroid moving for themselves. So we've had um, quite a lot of um, interest on our Facebook and Twitter um, sites and uh, the press and media and family and friends. You know, we're, share we're sharing the information on Facebook and we're getting so many sort of uh, comments and um, people are really, yeah, really enthusiastic. So, Nick, we have to explain to the audience, we really were planning to have a view of this live, but apparently weather <laughs> is not good over there, I, I understand. Yeah. Unfortunately, the weather is not playing along tonight. We had a lovely clear night yesterday. We got some really good footage. Um, and tonight, unfortunately, we've been in and out of cloud. And just prior to um, the start of the program, it, it's really clouded up for us. So we've just been unlucky, unfortunately. But that's how it goes. It's, it's part of the um, territory, I, I understand. Part of the package of being an astronomer is, is sitting up in a mountain in the freezing cold, <laughs> in, you know, under cloud. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. That was Nick Loring. She is with the South African Astronomical Observatory in Sutherland, South Africa. Thank you very, very much for helping us out today. Well, for astronomers using uh, op optical telescopes, 1998 QE2 is faint, it's far away, it's not very exciting. But for radar astronomers, QE2 is outstanding. With radar, they have image resolution of about 12 feet on an object 3.6 million miles away. And by the time they're through with this observation, they'll have a better idea of QE2's orbit, its size, its shape, and even surface features. 1998 QE2 is going to make a relatively close approach to Earth on May 31st. The orbit for this object is very well known. It'll be to the south, rising in the southeast, setting in the southwest. In late May, especially early June, it'll reach a visual magnitude of about 10 and a half to 11. And that means that amateur astronomers who have four or six inch telescopes could potentially see it. It is going to come within 15 lunar distances about 15 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Although it is labeled as a potentially hazardous asteroid, what that really means is that its orbit can approach within a certain distance of the Earth's orbit. For the foreseeable future, there's nothing to worry about. I mean, it's far more dangerous to walk across the street. The asteroid is believed to be about 1.7 miles in diameter. That is about nine QE2 cruise ships end to end. It rotates with 5.3 hours, and we know it's likely rounded. Even the most powerful optical telescopes, and I'm talking even, you know, Hubble telescope, they can only see this asteroid as a point of light. It is just too far and too small. Radar is a very powerful instrument that we use to study near-Earth asteroids. 
asked route to Tadis was millions of kilometers away, and we were able to resolve surface rocks. We could see boulders. There are currently only two radar facilities in the world that have sufficient sensitivity for doing regular observations of near-Earth objects, Arecibo and Goldstone. It provides an extraordinary opportunity to get very detailed radar images. You are transmitting microwaves. It's propagating at the speed of light toward the asteroid. It is bouncing back. And this radar echo is containing surface features of the asteroid. It's telling us about its rotation. And it's very precisely pinpointing its distance from the radar. This is a great opportunity because instead of sending a spacecraft to an asteroid, you are on Earth, an asteroid is coming to you. We think we're going to see images that will rival the caliber of what we can get from a spacecraft flyby mission. They really should be that detailed. And opportunities like that, um, they, they sometimes happen a few times a year, but this is the best one that we know of in 2013. And last night, Goldstone's 70-meter antenna, also known as DSS-14, was moved into position and pointed at asteroid 1998 QE2. And as we heard, it's one of two telescopes in the world that are large enough and with transmitters powerful enough to observe asteroids. Okay. So last night, DSS-14 sent out a radar signal from the antenna. The energy bounced off the asteroid and was received by the same antenna and then processed into images. Images like these. They don't look like pictures on your regular digital camera. They're more like ultrasound images. The principles are quite similar. They don't look like regular pictures, but you can still see things and recognize things. Right now, radar scientist Marina Brasovich is part of that observation team, and she is at Goldstone right now. She was observing last night to give yeah. us the results. Hi, Marina. Hi, how are you? So how did it go last night? Well, it, it was uh, quite a bit of surprise. So it turns out that 1998 QE2 is a binary asteroid. Big and surprise. And this is something that we did not expect. Um, especially, I was looking at this earlier footage, and we have to make some revisions to that period of rotation. So initially, we thought that it's rotating with a period of 5.3 hours, because that was what was reported to us by the, uh, from, by the optical observers and based on the light curves. But in, for such a type of rotation, we, we really don't expect to see any satellites. Uh, we're talking, and this one turned out to be ro rotating probably much more rapidly, uh, probably less than four hours. And the first thing we see, there's this uh, object and it has a satellite. Well, we have the still pictures that we can show folks. Um, and you can see the different frames and a very light, small object in front of it. Yes, yeah, so what you can see here, this uh, larger, uh, the, the larger object on the screen, that is the primary. That is the primary, and then this little bright speck of light over here in the back, that is the satellite. And the satellite is in its orbit around, around its primary, uh, like the moon would go around the Earth. Uh, so what you are seeing over here, these are radar images, they're different than optical images. And um, each frame is a snippet about 10 minutes of data, and you can clearly see that both the primary, this, these kind of features on the primary, these kind of radar dark spot, is rotating. It's, it's rotating as the, this time sequence is progressing. And at the same time, what you're seeing is that the, um, the satellite is moving more toward the back. So it's moving away from, from the asteroid. Now, where this is really evident is when you put it into a movie form. And we can show folks that right now. There you see it. Yeah, you can clearly see, you can see the evidence of the rotation of the primary because uh, this is, I have to say that these, these um, a resolution of these images is 75 meters per pixel. So we still haven't reached our highest possible resolution because the object is still a little bit far away. Uh, but even at the 75 meter resolution, what we can see is there are, there are clearly some radar dark features, some concavities maybe. Uh, maybe those are in fact craters or something, but we can't know this for sure. And we definitely can see that there is a satellite. We estimate the size of the primary was, was right on. So this was, it's about 2.7 kilometer in diameter. And the satellite is about 600 meters in diameter. So this satellite appears to be small on the radar image, but it's not. This is kind of this different dimension. On horizontal axis, it's a measure of how fast it rotates. So this wide echo, it just means that the primary is rotating really fast. So period less than four hours. 
and the little in the back, the narrow echo, just means that this asteroid is rotating really slowly, probably periods of less than one day, but many, many hours. Well, you sent us a, a video uh, earlier today to give us an example. You think that there are v great similarities between QE2 and an another asteroid that you have, and we can roll that too. Yes, well, so far we know that about 16% of asteroids in a near-Earth population that have diameters greater than 200 meters, we know they're binaries. And this is uh, one well-studied binary. This is based on a construction of radar data and when you reconstruct what radar data really means, you end up with this three-dimensional shape model. And this is asteroid 1999 KW4, and it's one of the best studies binaries. Uh, you see its primary rotating really rapidly, and then you see the satellite um, that, is, that is in the orbit around, around its primary. The reason why these, the binary asteroids are so important is because we can estimate the mass of the, of the asteroids. And if you know the size, then you can estimate the density and you can estimate the internal structure. And from here, you can infer things about the collisional history of the asteroid and in general about the processes that shaped the uh, terrestrial planets and the main belt asteroids. So you're able to get more information. This is information that be, could be used for missions. I, I understand that we used radar information to help us with missions like the Hartley 2 mission, in fact. Yes, that is correct. We, we frequently, we several, on several occasions, we, we radar provided a really key kind of data that helped uh, make uh, the mission kind of, op they optimized their uh, navigation sequence, um, and they, they just plan the, it, it's possible to plan a much safer, more efficient mission if you know how the object looks like prior of getting there. And people are always concerned about the orbit of these asteroids, that they could be on a collision course with the Earth. And there are times where we think, oh, it looks like it. But then as we get more and more information, like the information we're getting today, we can refine those orbits. And we will be able to refine it again after this observation, correct? Yeah, that is correct. So one of the, one of the really kind of powers of, of, of radar is that it can, it can locate where the asteroid is very precisely. It, pres it provides this very tight, uh, tight point in its orbit and refines it and based on that you can kind of extend, you can extend the orbit of that object uh, uh, centuries in advance and you can know exactly, you can better assess the risk, you know, the risk of potentially the, the asteroid hitting the Earth. Well before you go away Marina, we have a couple of questions from the social media audience. Um, these are questions that were posted on our Twitter page for Asteroid Watch, and here's one that's for you. What is the frequency of the radar that you use, and how big is your transmitter, transceiver, and where is it located? Okay, so we, have, we are working with the two radars. They're only currently, we are working with the radar at Arecibo. We are working radar at Goldstone. So Goldstone, this is a 70 meter antenna. It's transmitting at uh, 85, 60 megahertz. We have 500 kilowatts of power. And then at Arecibo, we have 300 meter diameter dish. And that one is a one megawatt power transmitter and it's transmitting in 2380 megahertz. Uh, Arecibo is about 20 times more sensitive than Goldstone, but Goldstone can cover much more of the sky because we have fully steerable antenna. So in effect, these two systems are really complementary. All right, here's another question from Asteroid Watch. Is the radar a ground, brace, a ground base or space radar to track celestial objects? Well, well, space radars are used all, all, I mean, constantly in the missions, but uh, kind of just to get the science data. But it's, it's really not necessary uh, to have a kind of space radar. Uh, we, we already are doing quite a bit of work with these two radars that we have on Earth. All right, so those are two questions from Asteroid Watch, and if you also have questions yourself that you would want to send them in to us, go ahead to our Twitter page at Asteroid Watch, twitter.com slash Asteroid Watch. Thanks, Marina. We look forward to seeing more results on this data. 1998 QE2 should be a great radar target from today all the way through June 9th. Thanks, Marina. Thank you very much.
And as we mentioned, seeing 1998 QE2 can be a challenge. It is small, it is faint, and it moves slowly. You won't be able to see the asteroid with the naked eye or even binoculars because it's 15 times as far away as the moon. But if you have the right telescope and know where to look, back yard astronomers will be able to see it. And that's why we pulled in Steve Whistler. Steve is a JPL system engineer that's worked on missions like Deep Impact and Epoxy. And he's also a trained astronomer who works with the amateur community. Now, Steve, you spotted QE2 yourself yesterday on your own telescope. That's right. I set it up last night. And uh, fortunately, I had clear weather. And I got about uh, 40 minutes worth of uh, imaging um, out of it. And uh, yeah, so it's definitely uh, possible to see with a small amateur telescope, even from a uh, near JPL here where there's a lot of light pollution. We have the picture that you sent us. We right. could put so, it up. Uh, this, uh, this, the uh, small little smudge there is the asteroid. Uh, there's a, a reference star that I uh, put in there. Uh, but it was, uh, it was fairly easy to set up and see. You need to uh, know where to look. And the best way to find out is to download the coordinates from JPL's Horizon website. Uh, I entered them into my computer and told the telescope to point there. So let's back up a little bit. So how bright was it? Uh, it it's is 11th magnitude, so it's about 100 times fainter than can be seen with the naked eye. Uh, this is why well, you wouldn't be able to see it in binoculars either. And again, it moves so slowly, it would be very hard to see visually just looking through the telescope. The, uh, the image there was 30 seconds, and so there was just a very faint smudge in 30 seconds. So uh, pho photographically, it's much more interesting. Well, folks will want to ask, what size telescope did you use? I used a 10-inch telescope. And we, we have uh, pictures of, of ones here, too, as well, sure. that we can cut to. How large is this one? That looks to be on the order of 12 inches, 12 to 14 inches. Um, that is not a computer-controlled telescope and would be relatively hard to find it in that. In this case, in this one would be tough. Uh, yes. Yeah. You really you need a good star it? chart uh, to understand what the background star field is going to look like and understand where the asteroid will be relative to those stars. And then it's, it's not too hard to do. So to help folks along, we could provide them a little bit of a star chart. We created sure. one for them. We can take a look and you can help them with this. Sure. Now this will show the path of the asteroid through the night sky. It's basically, it's got a southern declination, so it's, it is visible from Los Angeles. Tomorrow night it'll get as high as 37 degrees above the horizon. The further south you go, the better. Further north it's going to be a little bit worse. Uh, you would need a detailed star chart with the surrounding uh, stars that you would be able to see from your telescope in order to really pick it out and understand where it is relative to the stars. Because it is going to look like a star. Even in the Hubble Space Telescope, it would look like a star. How many days would we have this viewing opportunity? Uh, that I am not sure of. Certainly a few more days um, it would be uh, visible. So definitely look for it in, right. the, in the southern skies. Right. But again, if you go to uh, Horizon's website, or there's another, another, a number of other websites where you can download information that will tell you its position and magnitude uh, for every day. So a lot of people aren't aware of this, that there are telescopes that you can just take this orbital information, right. download it into your telescope and computer, and it looks for it for you. That's right. So where would you get information like that? Uh, there's a number of sites that uh, have the orbital elements. Again, JPL's Horizon uh, website is what I used. And there we have it on the screen for you is SSD dot jpl dot nasa dot gov slash horizons dot cgi and the target body that they type in is Would this that. number that is the I, jpl id for the target and that number is two eight five two six three so folks who, who probably are going to be pretty sophisticated right. have sophisticated That's computers correct. and telescopes mm -hmm. will be able to, right. to get most this. amateur telescopes sold today have computer control of some sort all right, but if you have one that you would have to focus mm -hmm. yourself, it's going to be a little yes. tough. If yes. Okay. So we have a couple of social media questions okay. for you, Steve. The first one is, am I going to be able to see it in South Florida? Oh, yes, definitely. Actually, probably yeah. better than Probably better we... than here, yeah. <laughs> assuming it's not cloudy, yeah. All right, so, yeah. That, so pretty much um, all over the United States we should be able to see it? Yeah, I, you know, I really couldn't say for, like, San Francisco and a above. Again, it's going to be really low on the horizon the further north you go. But certainly from the southern United States, it'll be easily visible. All right. Um, some other questions. Um, 
it, this would be probably more towards uh, folks who are worried about asteroids, and okay. I, I don't think that that would be good for you. Um, just rules of thumb mm -hmm. advice for people who want to do this, especially first timers. Mm -hmm. Should they go to, you know, various planetariums or something like that? Would that well, be helpful? It's really helpful to join an astronomy club to, to learn because talking to people and seeing how they do it is one of the best ways to learn uh, this, this hobby. And websites to kind of help Websites, lots people of along? great information on the websites um, as well. All right. Uh, Yahoo groups, those sorts of things. Uh, I, sh I should plug yeah. our own um, normal feature. We have a feature mm -hmm. on our own video website here at JPL, the What's Up series. That's correct. Yeah. Every single month, we mm -hmm. will tell you what to look for in the night sky. Yeah. So that's another one to keep in mind. Well, Steve, thank you. Thanks for the tips and the advice. And many of you who have probably the more sophisticated telescopes will be able to see QE2. So um, you will be able to see 1998 QE2 in your own backyard, but some of you won't, but don't despair. We have one more way for you to track this asteroid. It's a visualization tool developed here at JPL. It is called Eyes on the Solar System. Visualization producer Doug Ellison is here in Mission Control right now to give folks tips on how to use it. Doug? Thanks, Gay. Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, have already used our tool called Eyes on the Solar System. For those of you that haven't, you need any Java-enabled web browser on a Mac or a PC, and you just need to go to this website here. It's at eyes.nasa.gov. Now, the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a brief tour of a few interesting things in Eyes on the Solar System you can look at over the next year or so, and show you how you can ride on board with 1998 QE2 as well over the next few days. Let's go and have a look at Eyes on the Solar System. As you can see right here, what we have is essentially a live view of where QE2 is right now, using the very same trajectory data that Steve was just talking about. And you can see that it's about 3.6 million miles from the Earth. And we can take a look at the asteroid. Of course, the news that QE2 has a small moon was a surprise to all of us. And so we'll be adding that in the next few weeks to give uh, QE2 the most accurate representation we can. But let's leave this little module for now. I'm going to look at some other things in and around our solar system that might be interesting. Things that people may not have figured out for themselves in Eyes on the Solar System before. I'm going to go and click on the Visual Controls tab in the bottom right-hand corner here. And way up at the top, under the different sections, the kind of the layers of objects we have in Eyes on the Solar System, there's a section called Small Bodies. That's where we keep things like asteroids and comets. Now I'm going to turn on the comets layer, and you can see Eyes on the Solar System gets actually quite busy. You can see our old friend Hartley 2 that we explored with the epoxy spacecraft, Comet Ellen in over here, Halley's Comet, of course. But two comets in particular are going to be very, very exciting over the next year or so. I'm going to go and look at Comet Ison. You can see its orbit here. If we start fast forwarding through time, we're looking at May. This control down here, we can actually skip forwards. And now we're seeing Comet Ison screen towards the inner solar system. You can see right there, in October of this year, it actually gets pretty close to the planet Mars. Let's go and see just how close that is. We can double click on an object and ride on board with it. And I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so we can have a look at the coma around the comet. And I can right click on any object in Eyes on the Solar System, measure the distance from something, click on something else, and now I've got a virtual tape measure through space that tells me how far apart these two objects are. At this point, you can see that Mars and Comet Ison in October of 2013 are about 10 million miles apart, and they get within about 8 million miles. I'm going to back out to the whole of the solar system again with the Home button, and I'm going to keep fast-forwarding, and eventually you'll see Comet Ison get incredibly close to the Sun. It's an incredibly close flyby, something known as a sun-grazing comet. It gets so close. Now, if it survives that incredibly close approach to the sun, it's going to be a spectacular comet for people to see from the Earth at the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Now, let's go look at a different asteroid, a different comet. What I'm going to look at now is the one uh, discovered by the Siding Springs Observatory. It's right down here called 2013A1. Here it is. I'm going to go right on board the comet. And you can see right now, it's way, way out below the solar system. And I'm going to actually lock the camera from the shoulder of this comet onto the planet Mars. Let's lock the camera by right-clicking the mouse and hitting lock on. And I'm going to fast forward. And you can see we're now getting through November, December. And I'm going to keep going. You can see the MAVEN spacecraft gets to Mars not long before this comet flies past. And towards the end of next year, there you saw it, a very, very quick flyby. I was fast-forwarding a little bit too quick. Let's rewind time and look at that flyby in a little bit more detail. 
As we get closer, you can see Mars's moons, Phobos and Deimos. There they are. And from this comet, it gets incredibly close to the planet Mars. Let's just see how close that is. Let's go and look at Mars. Let's go and zoom well out of the planet. And we can measure that distance as well. We can right click on Mars, measure the distance from, and left click on the comet. And you can see at this point, it's only 72,000 miles, an incredibly close flyby. It's gonna be a spectacular thing to see from the surface of Mars, hopefully with our spacecraft in orbit around Mars and from the surface. And of course, comets aren't just something we look at from a long, long way away. Occasionally, we send spacecraft to don't go and take a slightly closer look at them. And if we go back to the present day, you'll see that this comet here, churomyov gerasimenko has a spacecraft very close to it, Rosetta. And right now, they're only a few million miles apart, in fact. You can see that distance, 16.6 .6 million miles. But if I start fast-forwarding time to about 12 months from now, the Rosetta mission, which uh, is a collaboration between the European Space Agency and NASA as well, if we go all the way through the beginning of next year, you're going to see that the Rosetta spacecraft gets incredibly close to this, uh, this comet as well. And in fact, it's going to go into orbit around the comet and eventually put a lander onto the surface of that comet as well. And so now what we're going to do is just go back to our little QE2 module. So you can all at home, right on board the asteroid, see exactly where it is. Up in the top corner is the Tours and Features module. I'm going to hit 1998 QE2. And we take you to this little mini module just about QE2. And by hitting the Ride Along button, there I am on board the asteroid. You can see the Earth and the Moon right behind it. For the kind of Bruce Willis view, bring up the controls and hit this kind of Ride Along button here. And suddenly you're riding on board the asteroid as it does its flyby of the Earth over the next few days. So that's Eyes on the Solar System. Once again, you can go to it by going to eyes.nasa.gov. And with that, I'm going to throw it back to Gay. Thanks, Doug. So you get to see it even though you don't see it in your own backyard, you can see it on the web. Paul Chodis is back with us. He's with the NEO program office. Let's kind of help people understand why asteroids are so important. There's a variety of reasons. It's not just the catastrophic fear factor. They, these are the, uh, some of the most primitive objects in the solar system. So they give us information, if we can study them, uh, about how the solar system was formed. What were the ingredients uh, that, that were in the nebula which formed the solar system? The, some of the most um, primitive uh, objects that we can uh, use to study the early nebula of the solar system. So we can learn about our own solar system. Uh, are these things something that we would be interested in in the future? It's also uh, surprising that there are hydrated minerals in some of these objects, which were formed in the uh, outer area, uh, outer asteroid belt, so they didn't uh, receive a lot of heating. And so it's possible that we could actually mine these objects. If we go out uh, with uh, some sort of, um, in the distant future possibly, or not so distant future, we could go out and extract things like water and oxygen from these and use them as resources in space, possibly. There are also many minerals that uh, are present in these objects. And so it, it's possible that these things could be source of, um, you know, resources and minerals that we could use on the Earth. But seems the common person seems to be most interested about asteroids because of concerns of, of the safety of the planet. Yeah. And your office has the job of tracking these asteroids. And we, we have a graphic of what we have seen in terms of numbers mm -hmm. since May 8th. But you tell me that the numbers have already increased. Yes, I think the number of near-Earth asteroids listed on the top there is at, up by at least 50 since wow. May, May the 8th. In, in less than a month. In less than a month. Objects, uh, near-Earth objects are discovered at uh, the rate of something like 80 per month. Wow. And asteroids in general are discovered at, at something like uh, 3,000 per month. And so uh, the, uh, the numbers are just exploding. We have 600,000 asteroids in our database right now. For the, uh, for the entire uh, list of asteroids. But you seem to have a real handle on the larger ones, the ones that are over one kilometer, say. Yes, uh, those were the first priority of the Near-Earth Object Program Office. Um, we wanted to know their orbits very accurately and the uncertainties, and we wanted to project them into the future. We wanted to know whether they could hit the Earth, especially. So um, we take the observations from the Minor Planet Center, located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They collect worldwide observations. We use those then to compute high-precision orbits for these asteroids, and that's a complicated mathematical process, but it's very important, and then project those into the future and look at all possible possibilities. We take into account 
account the gravity of the solar system. We go a hundred, about 100 years into the future, um, so it's, it's long on a human time scale, but on a, a solar system time scale, that's just a blink of the eye. And that information is constantly changing because as we get more and more information, say the things that we're getting from radar today, all that changes the, the computation of the orbit. Yes, so we will use the radar measurements that were made last night and will be made tomorrow. We'll use those to improve the orbit even better. In this case, we know this asteroid can't hit the Earth, but uh, using the radar measurements, we'll be able to predict it accurately hundreds of years into the future. And I would think that that information would be key if you are going to have a mission to an asteroid. You have to know exactly where it is at any given time. Yes, the more observations we get, the better. Radar really helps to pin down the orbit of an asteroid, as well as setting up, as, as indicating the size of it. Uh -huh. So we saw this morning those amazing images. That's the first time I've seen them, um, where, uh, which Marina showed. It was very impressive. Now we know that the size, our estimates of the size was pretty and accurate. And it's a binary. And a binary. Marina must have been really excited to see <laughs> that. The binaries are not so common. Uh-huh. Uh, so that was very exciting. I'm happy to see that. Uh, and we can get a good idea now of the mass of that asteroid if we track and know a little bit about the orbit of the, of the uh, secondary, the satellite, because the per orbital period of the satellite is related to the mass of the asteroid. All right, so the next mission to an asteroid is one to an asteroid called Bennu, and we have a picture of Bennu. Yes, now Bennu is about uh, half a kilometer, 500 meters in diameter. Actually, it's probably very similar in size to the satellite of uh, QE2, come to think of it. That, uh, the mission that will go to Bennu is called OSIRIS-REx. It's mm -hmm. a very exciting mission to be launched in the year 2016. We have visuals of that, in okay. fact. Let's see the visual. There it is. Here we are. This, the ast oh, here we are arriving at the asteroid in a, in around the year 2018. After uh, approximately a, a year of studying the asteroid at a distance, the spacecraft will deploy an arm and pick up samples from the surface of the asteroid. A uh, certain uh, number of grams. We'll put it into a return capsule, and then OSIRIS-REx will come back to the Earth and deploy that capsule, and it will land in the year 2023 in Utah. Now, and we'll actually have actual samples from that asteroid. That is an incredibly ambitious it's, endeavor. It's very exciting. But there is another one that is even more ambitious. Yes, um, NASA has proposed an asteroid initiative with a very exciting goal of going out to find a, a nearer Earth asteroid, one that's in an a, uh, orbit that's pretty close to the Earth. And we would d uh, send a spacecraft out there, a high-tech spacecraft, powered by solar arrays, deploy a bag around this asteroid, it has to be the right size here, about 20 to 30 feet in diameter, we'll deploy a bag, inflate it, and then move the spacecraft, uh, match its orbital speed, uh, the rotation speed, move the spacecraft around the asteroid, put it in the bag, and then cinch the bag, thus capturing the asteroid. Then we will actually have an entire asteroid, which we will have studied in detail at, uh, at some distance, and we'll be able to study how the whole thing is constructed, what its bulk properties are. Um, and this would be very useful information if we had or ever had to deflect an asteroid. We need to know things like uh, the, the bulk properties and the density, that sort of thing. Here we see the asteroid being pulled into the space, close to the spacecraft, the uh, advanced ion engines firing. We push the, space, the, the asteroid back towards the Earth, actually towards the moon, and put it into orbit around the moon, uh, which is a stable place. Then the Orion spacecraft uh, would launch with, astro with astronauts from Florida, and it could go up and visit the captured asteroid, which is in orbit around the moon. They could use tools to actually take samples from the asteroid and take very, the most interesting samples that, uh, from interesting areas on this asteroid. We, we put the samples then and return those to the Earth and we could study them up close. It's a very exciting mission. You personally have a role, a sort of a predecessor role to this mission in that it's going to be your job to well, find us that <laughs> asteroid. Well, the, uh, the, the Near-Earth Object Program Office is charged with finding and selecting a good target. And we need to find one that matches certain constraints. It has to be about the right size, 20 to 30 feet. 
and especially it has to be in an orbit that uh, passes the Earth fairly slowly so that the moon would have a chance of capturing it. So we are looking for very specific orbit types as well. And we have a, about a dozen candidates already, uh, and we, we think we will find more good candidates in the next few years. So we'll be looking at all the discoveries, and searching for these asteroids will be a high priority in the next few years. But it's, it's the same survey that we'll be searching for asteroids that could hit the Earth. So it's the same basic technique, but we'll be watching for those ones which are in orbits that could come close to the Earth very slowly and could be captured. And you're dis discovering new ones every day, so you may be seeing one quite soon. Yeah, every, every day, yes, uh, we'll, but we'll be looking for just the right one. I think right. we'll, we'll find one in the next few years. And timed just right to be where you want it just then. <laughs> we also need it to naturally come by the Earth at about the right time as well. That's uh, right. All right. We'll find one. As promised, we are doing some of the um, social media questions that you've hmm. sent in. We have one from Ted Wade. Um, if Hubble is retired or replaced, can it be assigned to NEO search duties? That's an interesting question. Well, a good question. Um, Hubble is not well suited to search for asteroids. It actually uh, has a very narrow field of view and can take very detailed close-ups of particular objects. But what we need is to search large regions of the sky to find uh, an object in which we don't know where it is. So we, we need to have a large field of view. So Hubble is not the appropriate um, instrument to find asteroids. Well, we have Marina standing by as well. Both of you could help us with this. What do we know about 1998 QE2's composition and what might we learn about it during the, this flyby? So both of you can probably help us with that. You know a little bit about the composition, you said. We think we know basically what it looks like, yes, um, and that it's very dark, it's carbonaceous, and it's uh, very primitive uh, elements coming from the outer solar system. But uh, I was fascinated to see the craters on Marina's images. Very interesting. Um, we, uh, and we were, as I say, it would be great to learn about the density of this object um, from the orbital period of its satellite. Then we will know approximately, um, it give us a better idea of the composition. I'll, I'll give this question also to Marina. The question is, um, what do we know about QE2's composition? and what might we learn during this flyby? And you and I talked a little bit earlier on. You said since it's dark, it may be larger than you thought it would was. Right. Do you still believe that's the case, that it's larger than you thought? I don't hear a thing. Apparently, apparently, uh, Marina I hear, still I hear can't hear me. Um, but there was a, a question tone. at one point. And that I can they, hear Gail very, OK. I think she can hear I me can now. I can hear. Yes, okay, I can hear good. now. Okay, Marina can hear me. Do you think that this asteroid is larger than you first anticipated it to be? Uh, 1998 QE2, it's, it's about uh, right size. So whatever, this was, this was initially estimated by Spitzer Science Telescope. Uh, based on Spitzer Science Telescope data, they estimated it, that it has reflectivity about 6% and 2.7 kilometer diameter. So uh, from what we can see from the visible extent of the radar images, it is, it is about right. Now, this is one radar observation, but you mentioned that you're going to be doing several others in, in the coming year. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it is correct. What we do, this is uh, basically, we, we always observe, uh, we, well, last year was really busy. Let me tell you about last year. <laughs> last year, we observed 66 asteroids only at Arecibo, and we observed 28 asteroids at Goldstone. We, we spend like 400 hours observing asteroids only at Goldstone. So it's, we are, you know, we have a very busy asteroid season ahead. Uh, we are probably expecting, again, uh, probably 50 objects to be observed. Not everything is going to be uh, glorious images, as you have seen. Some of them will be just a detection, but just as important because we can get their orbits right and maybe some initial physical characterization. But um, I think that the next good target, next good radar target is coming this summer. It's coming in August. It's asteroid 2005 WK4. And um, it's about 300 meters, as we think it's about 300 meters in diameter. So it is a smaller than the satellite of 1998 QE2, which is about 600 meters in diameter. And this one is going to come relatively close, about eight lunar distances. And so we expect to really have a very nice images. 
And then the ne next year, uh, we are going to have a chance to observe a comet. So this is uh, going to be comet linear. Uh, it's 209P li comet linear in May of 2013. Usually we don't have opportunities to observe comet with, with radar because they just don't come close enough. This one is going to be at about 20, 22 lunar distances and uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be able to get a peek at this type of object. But what is interesting, it is going to be a real treat for the optical observers because there are some indications that there's going to be a really amazing meteor shower uh, caused by this comet. So this comet is periodic comet, and um, Earth is going to pass through the trails of that this comet deposited in 1800s. And uh, in May of next year, uh, there is supposed to be a really nice meteor shower, and we will also get to observe the object that produced this meteor shower. All right, I have another asteroid watch question, either from Marina or Paul. I know how you find them, but how do you work out its trajectory based on a single lens scope? Well, it's not just a single observation. We actually collect all the observations, and there could be hundreds of them uh, for a well-observed object, and we fold them all into the math of the known gravity fields of the sun and all of the planets, and we figure out which is the orbit okay. that will so fit I'm, all I'm of okay. those no best. So, and there's some uncertainty, of course. There always will be some because the observations are not perfect. But we get a very good idea. The uh, more observations, the better. We'll get a very good idea of the orbit and uh, at a particular time. And then we will project that into the future as well. All right. So we're going to wrap up some of these questions for now. And we'd like to thank Marina for helping us out with some of these asteroid questions. Thank you so much. And some of these questions were very good and very sharp. They, they are already aware of how we track asteroids. They are more interested on how exactly do we figure out the orbits. So we're going to move on ahead now. Asteroids are a very high priority at NASA for a number of different reasons, to protect the planet, as Paul told us, to understand how the solar system formed because it holds the elements that were the very, very beginning of our formation, and to explore it as a possible resource that one day we could possibly mine these asteroids. To tell us more, it is my pleasure to introduce the administrator of NASA, Charles Bolden. He joins us now from NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. Administrator Bolden, thanks so much for taking some time out for us. Thanks very much for letting me come to you. I don't know whether, uh, whether I'm coming through or not, but uh, I've, I've had an opportunity to listen to some of the questions and, uh, and the comments that have been going on, and I find it quite enlightening. You know, um, as we get more and more excited about every opportunity to, to see an asteroid or a comet or learn more about it, uh, we find that NASA's present strategy for dealing with asteroids is falling more into line. I would remind everyone that in our 2014 budget request, the president actually added an additional $20 million, bringing us up to a grand total of $40 million for what I consider to be the most critical effort right now, which is uh, identification and characterization of uh, near-Earth asteroids, particularly Earth-threatening asteroids, um, those that, that we know very little about and, and know not enough about the number, size, uh, characteristics of them. Uh, we mentioned in our 2014 budget also that we, were, we would put aside $105 million uh, to begin or to continue our effort to do three things. Uh, one, identification and characterization. Second, which is sort of new, would be actually uh, rendezvousing with and trying to redirect an asteroid, uh, sort of in response to our, our question that we always get about, can we protect the planet? The answer to that is no right now. Uh, but if we're able to demonstrate that humans are able to redirect an asteroid or, or deflect it in some slight way, we may be getting close to the day that we say, yes, we can protect the planet. And then the third segment of that strategy is uh, to utilize SLS and MPCV or our heavy lift rocket and multipurpose crew vehicle in development right now uh, to take an, astro an astronaut crew uh, into cislunar space in a, in a stable orbit where we would have relocated the asteroid to actually do some human interaction with an asteroid. All of this in sort of meeting the president's challenge to put humans with an asteroid by 2025. 
Uh, I don't need to tell this audience, uh, NASA has a long, long, long history of investigation and study of asteroids. Uh, we work with our international partners. For example, the, the Japanese uh, very successful with their Hayabusa mission in bringing back uh, a sample. We have OSIRIS-REx Osiris that we're all excited about that's going to launch uh, in the next few years and then bring us back a sample in the 2020s. Um, and we also are currently watching uh, Dawn, the, the Dawn spacecraft, wind its way away from Vesta where it made amazing discoveries onto Cirrus that I am told is an asteroid, but some people may even classify as a minor, as a, as a, a minor planet or a, a dwarf planet. So there's a lot of excitement ahead, and I just want to thank you all for letting me join this team today to talk a little bit about what NASA is doing. So I, I think you're probably going to move on to questions or something, and I'll, yes, I I'll stand one. by. Yes, I have one for you right now. How does the asteroid initiative fit into this overall agency plan to go to Mars and beyond? Gay, it, um, the asteroid strategy, if you will, consists of three segments, as I, as I just mentioned. And very briefly, for the sake of redundancy, let me, let me mention what they are again. The first part of the strategy, the critical part for us, is identification and characterization of, of as many asteroids in our solar system as we can. The ones we're primarily interested in and the ones that the folk out at JPL and other, other NASA centers are working on is identifying those that are Earth-threatening, the, the near-Earth objects that, are, that at some point may, may have a potential to impact Earth or uh, impact some of the satellites that are orbiting Earth. So that's, that's the first segment. The president has, has proposed $40 million for that in the 2014 budget. The second segment that we're proposing, which is new, is to actually utilize, continue our development of solar electric propulsion, new propulsion techniques to rendezvous with and actually try to redirect a small asteroid uh, or a small piece of an asteroid to the lunar vicinity, what we call cislunar or some people call it translunar space. So it would be in a counter-rotating orbit of the moon, putting it close enough that, that within a reasonable amount of time, we could launch an astronaut crew that would go rendezvous in lunar orbit with this asteroid and do the third segment, uh, which would be to actually have human interaction with an asteroid. It, it is still to be decided whether that's robotic uh, human interaction where the crew never has to leave the vehicle or whether we venture out on an EVA and do some, some direct intervention or, or interaction with it, uh, like physically taking samples by hand so that we can bring them back to Earth. Um, one thing I will tell, or s some clarification that I will tell people, this is not a science strategy. This is not a human exploration strategy. It's not a technology development strategy. It is, for perhaps the first time, uh, a synergized strategy that pulls together everything that NASA does and does so well. And it even involves our aeronautics mission directorate because that's the home of, of, of our knowledge of fundamental hypersonics research. Uh, and every time you leave and return to the planet or go to another planet nowadays, uh, we're utilizing what the aeronautics folk teach us about hypersonics research. So it's exciting for us. I hope it's exciting for all of our employees because they're going to be doing a taste of everything. And, and as always happens there, nobody's going to be perfectly happy, but everybody hopefully will get a piece of this pie. Well, speaking of synergy, you, you mentioned that a lot of different pieces will be fitting together different NASA centers, but other U.S. agencies perhaps, perhaps international partnerships? What are we talking about? Gay, it is our hope, and, and we have already begun the effort of working collaboratively with other agencies of the government, uh, whether it's the Department of Energy, uh, on and on and on, uh, and we have also engaged our international partners. One of the first sets of calls that I made on the morning uh, that we were rolling our budget out was to the heads of, of, of our partner agencies on the International Space Station. And there are, there are five big agencies that, that predominantly run the International Space Agency. Uh, the Russian Space Agency, JAXA from Japan, Canadian Space Agency, the European Space Agency, which is huge. Uh, Jean-Jacques Dordain is, the, is the, the, um, the head of the European Space Agency, which encompasses uh, more than 20 different nations in Europe and then the United States through NASA. But all of them were briefed on this concept. All of them were very receptive. Uh, and everybody's waiting to see how we're going to formulate the, 
the actual details of the mission. So mission formulation will begin uh, later this, this summer, uh, and hopefully we will be able to come out and, and brief the American public on a little bit more meaty concept sometime next fall or, or winter. All right. Well, we promised our audience that we would also give you a social media question. So here is one, and it could be a tough <laughs> one for you. It's uh, they if, usually are. <laughs> yeah, they are. If an asteroid was to collide with Earth, is there anything we could do about it? Gay, unfortunately for the, for the questioner, um, the answer is no, right now. The, and let's, let's not say that. We, we work with FEMA today, with the Federal Emergency Management Agency. We work with the Department of State. We work with the Department of Defense. When we get indications, and it is NASA usually that gets the first indications that a near-Earth object is inbound, whether it's junk falling from space, as we have had happen several times over the past 12 to 14 months, or whether it is really an asteroid, uh, as was the case uh, a few months ago, we, we notify our partner agencies. If it's one that looks like its trajectory is going to bring it and potentially impact Earth, uh, we work as diligently as we can with other agencies to get an ac as accurate a prediction of the entry point and potential impact point as we can so that, the, so that FEMA can then begin to work if it's going to impact uh, the continental, the United States, or so the State Department can begin to act if, it, if we think that it's going to impact one of our, one, another nation of the world, because these are not national threats. These are, these are global threats. And so uh, we have already had to do this many times in the past, um, and, and it seems to have worked relatively well. Uh, we were surprised, I think, as everybody knows, by the, by the small asteroid that that surprised us over Russia about two or three months ago. Um, but that's what we're trying to avoid with increased effort on identification and characterization, is it so that we're not surprised by something that can, can impact Earth. Uh, but the, the, the mitigation, the actual ability to protect Earth, uh, is not within our technological grasp right now. And that's, that's why this, the asteroid strategy and the second segment of, of actually a, an effort to redirect an asteroid is so, so important to the world, not just to the U.S. And we heard it from you. It's not a, an easy thing to answer, <laughs> but there are steps being made in that direction, and that's the most important thing. Yes, very much so. All right. Well, thank you so much for the update, Administrator Bolden. We appreciate you carving out a little bit of your day <laughs> just for us and to be a part of our program. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks so very much for letting me be a part of the program. And, and, and thanks to all of the folk around the NASA family uh, who, who work at this so diligently every day. Um, my visit to JPL, for example, last week was vi really, really, really enlightening and informative to me. And uh, it's always good to meet with a bunch of people that, that are passionate about things like saving the earth the way that you all are out there. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure having you a part of the show. Thank you. So we have a few more um, social media questions that I can have you field, Paul, if you're OK. And some of them are kind of tough. Um, how far can we watch an incoming asteroid and get an early warning? Well, that would depend on how big it is. Um, and it would also depend on its sort of orbit. This was an eccentric orbit for QE2. We had a chance to see it 15 years ago, and we discovered it then when it was relatively near the Earth. Uh, we, we would be able to see many of these, many orbits before they would hit the Earth if, if it was on a co collision course. So the idea is to discover them as early as possible. Um, the earlier we find them, the more warning time we have more information. Well, that wraps things up for us here at JPL. We'd like to thank the folks at the South Africa Astronomical Observatory in Sutherland, the radar scientists and the team at Goldstone. Of course, Paul Chodas, Steve Whistler, and Doug Ellison here at JPL in Mission Control. And we, and of course, Administrator Bolden. And we look forward to all the exciting results ahead. Now, if you're interested in more information about asteroids, here are two websites to check out nasa.gov slash asteroids or you can follow us on twitter at twitter.com slash asteroid watch thanks for watching everyone